everyone. Welcome to our Duke for Good Lightning Talk series. This month marks our sixth round, and the theme this month is Forest and Nature. My name is Tanya Birch, and I'm a program manager on the Google Earth Outreach team working on our Forest and Nature initiatives. So last year, we started, we started a series of monthly lightning talks by and for nonprofits, scientists, and other change makers who want to leverage mapping tools and technology for positive impact in the world. And this week, our forest and nature talks are held today and Thursday. Um, for we're featuring 10 scientists who are innovating to protect, manage, and restore uh, our, na our natural ecosystems in our global and local communities. Um, so we hope these three to five minute talks, lightning talks, are gonna inspire you to think about new ways you can have an impact with our mapping tools or provide operational or practical tips and hints to improve and optimize your workflows. Um, I'm really excited today to welcome our, um, our speakers, Richard Fernandez, Emil Charrington, Beatrice Bellon, Nico Lang, and John Musinski. But before we kick off the first presentation, uh, I'd like to call your attention to two things. And first is the Q&A feature. So if you're watching live, you can write your question in the Q&A section below this page. And if you have a specific question that you want to address to a specific speaker, um, please write the, the identify the, the speaker and who the question is for, and then write your question in the Q&A section. And then second is the link to the slides, uh, which you can find below in the resources section. So, okay, let's get started. Um, first up, I'd like to welcome Richard Fernandez, who is a research scientist, and he develops and validates algorithm for global mapping of vegetation structure. Uh, for, he works for the Government of Canada, Center for Remote Sensing, and he's going to be presenting on the landscape evolution and forecasting or LEAF toolbox. So let's hear his talk. Hi, I'm Richard Fernandez, and I'm going to be presenting the LEAF or landscape evolution and forecasting toolbox. Uh, this is a Google Earth Engine application that we've developed at the Canada Center for Remote Sensing with uh, colleagues in Europe and America as well. So stepping back a bit, I think it's important to, to get the motivation for why we're doing this. And, and the reason is that um, we need information on the status and trends of the vegetation on Earth for sustainable development issues. But not just inf any information, we need it to be free and open so everyone can access it. And because we're in the government, we want to make sure that it's reliable, there's quality to it. And most importantly, that it's useful, that it, it speaks to the questions people have. And so when we're thinking about questions, I think it's good to frame that from the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And these goals will change over time, but if you read through them, the certain questions start popping up and you can imagine that geographic information is the answer or supporting answer to some of them. Questions like, you know, do we have sustainable food and water supplies? Um, are ecosystems healthy? Uh, does the human impacts on energy and mineral production uh, you know, is that sustainable? Uh, how big is the impact? What's our footprint in terms of our climate impacts and the feedback on vegetation? And fundamentally, it's it's not just you know scientific information in journal papers or in databases, but really uh, that information has to be acted upon and people have to act upon it. And a good way to motivate people acting upon things is to give them access to it and they can see how their activities, how their decisions, impact the environment around them and globally. So it's, uh, you know, stepping uh, forward now, uh, as I said, in a government, we think about standards and we think about reliability. So over 25 years ago, uh, there was a process within the United Nations to define essential climate variables. So these are things related to the physical system, the earth, the atmosphere, the oceans. And they're things that are needed widespread for models, for trend analysis, and they're very standardized. And I'm gonna talk about vegetation. So just in the corner here, biosphere, the green thing. Now we have to focus a bit because there are a lot of things you can derive from satellite information and from Earth Engine applications. And uh, 15 years ago, I was involved in developing with the Canadian and European Space Agency, the Sentinel-2 mission. It's a lot like the Landsat, which you probably heard of, but this one has higher spatial resolution, 10 meters. Every five days, it comes over most of the Earth and it's gonna go on pretty well indefinitely. And back then, together with the Europeans, we defined, we need some of these essential variables, leaf area index, the density of vegetation, things like the fraction of vegetation cover and how much of light is used for photosynthesis. And we had 
uh, requirements for accuracy. But interestingly enough, we actually didn't have the science to hit those requirements from algorithms, nor did Europe or Canada have the way of processing the global data sets so everyone can have it. So we actually didn't have the processing capacity. And so follow up, you know, about seven years ago, six, seven years ago, in Canada at our, at our center, I led a project where we said, well, what would be the ideal system to generate this information for everyone? This was before we knew about Google Earth Engine. Actually, it was just in parallel, it was just starting up. And you know, you can see it looks a lot like Earth Engine. Analysis ready data sets, so Sentinel data and Landsat data, a processing system, an interface to your desktop or cell phone. But the other special ingredient that we figured we would need is algorithm scientists uploading or interfacing their own algorithms into the system. So we don't want it that every time someone in Canada or China or Africa has a new algorithm for mapping vegetation cover, has to develop their own software. They should just upload it into the system and it should apply to the data. There's a lot of details on the left. And if you look at the slides later, you can see how we do it. But I'll give you an example. This is an algorithm that we've developed with the French, which is for Sentinel-2. And what, what happens is that in this case in MATLAB, we train neural networks so prediction regression algorithms using basically ray tracing graphics, computer graphics models that you see in Disney movies. And this is a database where it simulates what the satellite would see for different vegetation conditions. And we have hundreds of thousands of these conditions. We train these networks, which are not basically just a bunch of coefficients and a feature collection, Earth Engine terminology. We upload it into Earth Engine and we apply it. But the trick is here, we've actually gone and made our own processing algorithms on the server to apply neural networks rather than having to go to the Google, Google AI platform. And it's not because we don't like the AI platform. In fact, we train now our networks on the AI platform, but it's just a lot faster and this sort of free and open idea, you don't have to pay for it, where you can now apply neural networks on the server to make maps. And finally, if you want to take a look at it, uh, it's a GitHub site there that I have where you know, you can get our code, you can run our links to run the application. On the left, you see an example of an Earth Engine application in JavaScript. It can map anywhere in the world uh, from Sentinel-2 or Landsat, we're adding more sensors now, the planet, anywhere in the world for these parameters. Uh, we have uncertainty estimates together with it, and we do a lot of work with the Americans and the Europeans and the Chinese and others to validate these things. So we're backing up for the performance. The other interesting thing is we've ported everything to the Python API in Earth Engine. So you can take it and run it your own operating, your own processing system. And as an example, these are maps we're routinely making over Canada. They're monthly maps at 20 meter resolution for 10 million square kilometers using Earth Engine. It takes about four to five days to make a map for each month. Um, well, actually maps of all the parameters. And we're working with Google now to try and speed that up using uh, the Google Cloud Platform system. So it'll be done you know, in an hour maybe for, and that's, that's an area the size of Europe, it's bigger than the size of the uh, United States. So I welcome you to look at our GitHub site and, uh, you know, you can get all the contacts to us, the code, everything from there, and uh, hopefully you can take it and use it for your needs. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. It's great to see how you're applying uh, neural networks, the Python API, local servers, as well as the Google Cloud. Uh, my question for you is, how has the LEAF toolbox been used in academic settings or for changing policy outcomes? Yeah, that, uh, it's a good question because, I mean, the whole motivation was not just science, it was to impact. And the way we're doing it is that uh, we're working within, uh, in Canada, we have a, a new agency that's looking at cumulative environmental effects of, of, of development. And uh, that agency is very data hungry. Um, Environmental effects in Canada are very, uh, need to be done quickly and transparently. And one of the things they need is spatial data sets. So what we're doing is we're using this to, to map or actually to give local constituents, so uh, indigenous groups, uh, companies, et cetera, the access to these tools to make the maps for the regions. And it could span from a small mining site of a few kilometers squared to you know Hudson Bay lowlands, uh, which is 10, 5, 5,000 kilometers squared. So, you know, there's no, it scales uh, basically transparently, and that's because of, of the Google software. Um, so we're very excited about that. We're excited about actually giving this to scientists now as well, and to have them upload their own algorithms and develop their own algorithms. 
So that's, I think, the next stage. That's actually why I'm talking to them, is to get experts to come in and contribute towards this help everywhere. Fantastic. So I hope we see some active questions from the audience. If you have any questions for Richard, please feel free to put them in at the bottom of the page. Um, we're going to move along to Emil Charrington, who is a researcher at NASA Severe Science Coordination Office. And he's going to be presenting on monitoring the Mesoamerican Biological Corridor. So let's hear his talk. Hi, everyone. The challenge we're using Earth Engine to address is monitoring the Mesoamerican Biological Corridor. The MBC is a network of both protected areas and the corridors connecting those reserves and was set up in 1993 by the governments of eight countries to protect this biodiversity hotspot where 9% of the world's terrestrial species are found on less than 1% of the world's landmass. While there have been earlier regional studies of the status of ecosystems and land cover, regional institutions like the Central American Integration System have been requesting more recent information, as well as trying to understand how the region and the MBC have changed since the corridor was originally established. And that's where Earth Engine comes in because of its access to the full Landsat archive, as well as its ability to provide for regular monitoring. Toward those goals, we decided to use Robert Kennedy's Land Trender algorithm, which was implemented in Earth Engine a few years ago, and which uses machine learning methods to evaluate changes using the Landsat archive. For the Mesoamerica domain covering roughly 50 Landsat path rows, there are over 33,000 Landsat scenes uh, from Landsat 4 through 8, and Land Trender provides a fairly quick and efficient way of generating change maps like we can see on the right. Still, what many might not be aware of is that LandTrender can do more than just detect changes using Landsat data. It can also be used to detect change using other data sets. And beyond that, Robert Kennedy and his lab at OSU have developed a way to generate gap-filled and also radiometrically harmonized data, which we can refer to as a temporal data cube for the lack of a better term. So if we're interested in looking at the MBC the year before it was formally established, as well as last year, we'll see that there are gaps in the data record with barely any Landsat 4 and 5 data covering 1992. However, using LandTrender, it's possible to simulate the reflectance for 1992 using data from other years, as well as to harmonize that reflectance to 2021 to make the data more comparable. And from that data, in addition to change maps, we were able to generate forest cover maps, which show the changes between 1992 and 2021, showing that the MBC lost roughly only 3% of its forest cover, but that translates to a loss of over 23,000 hectares of forest per year. So for this work, Sevier has been collaborating with the Central American Integration System, SICA, in the framework of a joint statement that NASA and SICA signed in 2019. Also with SICA, we've been conducting webinars to introduce more regional specialists and institutions to Earth Engine, and we've published some of that work uh, our analyses using Earth Engine apps. That's been our work in a nutshell, and you can follow our exploits on Twitter. Thank you to Google for the opportunity to share our work. Thanks so much, Emil. Uh, we're happy to be joined by you here today live. Um, my question for you is uh, protected area coverage, as you demonstrated, has expanded by 8% in the Mesoamerican Biological Corridor from 1993 to 2010. So about 17 years. Um, and yet you've demonstrated that the forest cover has still declined in the MBC. So do you think modeling some of the threats to the deforestation or the, the threats to the overall protected area network um, and threats to the forest cover uh, writ large are, are important to understand and examine as well to change the trajectory for forest loss? And how do you see your science being used um, looking forwards into the future? Yeah, thank you so much for the question, Tanya. And I guess regarding the threats, um, maybe just a reminder as well that, uh, as said, the, the MBC also lost, on average, over 23,000 hectares a year between 1992 and 2021. And to put that in scale, um, 23,000 hectares is larger than the two smallest countries in Central America, which are El Salvador and Belize, which are you know both smaller than that. Um, however, again, towards this, uh, Thanks to Google Earth Engine and also the Land Trender algorithm, you know those have been, you know, really important to be able to do this work. And so, in terms of, and however, we also have to kind of recognize the important work that's already being done in the region by uh, national governments, 
particularly in the context of uh, Red Plus, funded by the by the World Bank's FCPF and also by UN Red. Uh, however, also supported by uh, important uh, you know work from from the U.S. government through Civil Carbon. And so, specifically in terms of your your question about future tra trajectories, uh, one thing that you know could be uh, really interesting would be uh, additional tools and perhaps code from um, the Earth Engine team that could kind of expand on that. Uh, in other words, it's it's really um, it's fairly simple to kind of look at what's already changed, but in terms of you know knowing what has changed, that gives us an idea of what could change. And so uh, you know tools that would allow us to do you know trajectories, scenarios into the future, and, and give us an idea of you know based on past change, what's going to change. And so just to say that this is uh, tangentially related to you know the work of the Forest Data Partnership, which involves uh, not, not only Google but also the private sector, also Severe. And so again, annual monitoring that the country's already doing. Um, and just regarding you know, how that links to the forest data partnership, just to say that you know, earlier studies have shown that a lot of the agriculture, the expansion has been due to you know, agriculture for export. And so that again, links into that. Um, and then lastly, to say that we've been working really closely with the, the governments through uh, SICA. And you know, we're interested in seeing how you know, some of this stuff can fit into what they're doing and looking forward to other opportunities and other things that will be coming down through the pipeline through the Forest Data Partnership. Thank you. Thanks, Emil. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to to collaborate with you on the Forest Data Partnership as well. It's it's an uh, exciting time. All right, so let's uh, move along to Beatrice Bellon. Uh, she's a postdoc at Rhodes University in South Africa. And during her postdoc, she's developing a um, an app, an Earth Engine app called the Coexist Land app to assist in the monitoring of general occupancy patterns of medium to large sized terrestrial vertebrate communities and species uh, across protected, protected or multi-use landscapes. Uh, so welcome Beatrice, uh, over to you. Let's hear your talk. Hi everyone, I'm Beatrice. And today I will be running a quick demo of Coexist Land, uh, a new species uh, occurrence modeling app that we are developing with uh, Xander Venter and two colleagues from Université d'Angers and uh, Rhodes University in South Africa. So the main aim of this app is to allow users that have species present data uh, in some locations to derive landscape level um, predictions of species distribution. So we created this app um, because people are increasingly collecting species presence, presence data across the world, especially uh, with camera traps. Uh, but many users don't have this technical skills to uh, derive large scale predictions out of uh, field data. So hopefully this app will help make uh, biodiversity monitoring a little more accessible uh, to everyone, uh, especially people with limited skill sets. So the first step is to select uh, a, dat a data set. So species occurrence data set, if you have one, or you can so you can upload your own data or you can uh, select uh, one of the sample data sets that we already preloaded into the app. So the idea is to keep populating the app with uh, new data sets as they become available. And for this demo, I'm going to just select uh, this one from uh, so it's a mammal occurrence data set uh, in Kruger National Park in South Africa. So once the data is selected, the app will show uh, uh, the different points where the data was collected and it will delimit the area uh, with a bounding box. So you can either use this as the limits of your final modeling uh, predictions or you can redraw uh, the boundaries to expand it a little. So once you're done and happy with the extent of your area, uh, you can um, uh, you will have to fill in some parameters. So you can do this in any order as you wish. Uh, I'm first going to select here uh, the species of interest. So you, there will be a list that pops up with all the species that were detected in your data. Um, and here uh, you can either select one single species or you can select multiple species. In that case, you will get uh, species richness estimates. So per pixel, you will have an estimate of the number of species present. Here, I'm going to uh, model the occurrence probability of uh, Loxodonta africana, so the elephant. When you finish selecting, you click here, and then you can move on 
So here I'm going to select uh, next the modeling framework. So for now we have uh, two modeling frameworks, Random Forest and Maxent. I'm going to, uh, so later on we will be offering uh, other options for modeling frameworks. Here I'm going to, uh, I'm going for a Random Forest. Next, uh, you will have to select the landscape metrics that you want to include as predictors uh, in your occupancy model. So here I'm selecting two uh, and normalized difference vegetation index based uh, metrics. So this uh, two will uh, describe different conditions of vegetation and then elevation and slope. Uh, for now, we only provide these five uh, landscape metrics, but again, we will include some more uh, later on. And finally, you have to fi fill in the time frame of analysis. So in this case, uh, the data was collected in 2018. So I'm, I want my landscape metrics to reflect the environmental conditions in the same year. So I'm going to select a time frame from January 2018 to December 2018. And then once you fill in all the parameters, you can click on generate model to get your outputs. Okay, so uh, in the main screen, you will be able to visualize the predictions of the models. Uh, and you can also uh, switch to uh, visualize also the layers of the landscape metrics um, so that you used uh, to, the, to derive the predictions. Uh, it might take a little while to charge, but it's, it's usually quite fast. You can also generate download links to download the data into your um, computer. So, um, this would be in raster format. And finally, you will have on the left a panel some extra information. So you first have here a table that summarizes the list of models that you run with the parameters you used for each of them. You can run multiple models with the changing parameters each time. And you will have an idea of the error associated to the predictions. You, can, you will also have a validation plot that will give you an idea. You can visually assess how well the predicted data uh, fits the observed data. And finally, you will have a bar chart with information on variable importance. So you can assess which landscape metrics are contributing the most to the predictions. So the app is now available in this address. Uh, we hosted it under a uh, Earth Engine account named after the app, so it can be easily accessed. That's all for me. I hope you enjoyed the demo. You may find further details in the technical documentation that you can find right here. And I'll be happy to connect by email if you have any questions or remarks. Thank you so much. Hi, Beatrice. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, I have sort of a Super easy question for you, and then a more difficult question. One is, um, how can people easily access? Uh, is there a URL we can we can give folks that's uh, that's easy for them to explore the data? That's part one. Um, and then part two is, um, in what context do you hope the species occurrence models will be used? Like, are you hoping the larger scale analyses will incorporate the modeling techniques that you've done to conserve wildlife populations and where and um, do you see do you see these uh, analyses being able to be you know generalized to other regions, um, or does that present additional hurdles to to overcome? Okay, so sure, thank you, Tanya. Um, so user, it's a, the app is now available publicly, so open to everyone to start using it. Uh, it's still work in progress, so please, if you have any questions or have data and you want to collaborate with us. Do not hesitate to contact us. But I'm, I'm going to post the link to access the app uh, in the chat box right after. And uh, so, yes, the we want to reach, the idea was to reach out to users from very different backgrounds. So, of course, it, it will be an interesting tool for the conservation community, but it can also be used as a learning and teaching tool, for example, for students. Um, and we were also hoping, sort of hoping, that it could be used also by communities, which uh, maybe are coexisting with wildlife in their day-to-day. -day. So, for example, the app could be used to monitor species uh, occupancy beyond protected areas limits, uh, maybe by people that are coping with human-wildlife conflict, people that are 
uh, living with, uh, by, with different wildlife species. And so um, this kind of information uh, that we can bring to them, uh, they might help uh, uh, those communities implement management practices that can help mitigate conflict, for example. So we think this is really crucial to support biodiversity conservation, not only uh, within the, the conservation context, um, classical uh, protected area uh, areas. So also uh, at the large scale, so it could be a great um, exploratory tool uh, uh, that could be used uh, to broadly locate uh, potentially high conservation value areas on which uh, to prioritize uh, conservation efforts. So for example, it can help uh, design uh, at large landscape levels, uh, buffer zones, uh, corridors, sustainable use areas, etc. So it's it's a great like to aim to expand protected area network to 30% by 2030. But we need to be aware that there are regions which which have limited resources um, for conservation. So we need to to have this bring this information at large scale to be able to strategically concentrate um, conservation actions in key biodiversity areas. And so, well, we want to the app to keep it to be simple, intuitive, and applicable to a range of species and landscape contexts, um, rather than focusing on flexibility and performance for specific contexts. So we know there's no like one size fits all set of variables and modeling frameworks. So for some context, I guess, um, and species, uh, the, the parameters that are available will, will be predictive enough and will, will uh, give interesting results and be spot on. And for other contexts, uh, it will, of course, be less adequate. But the idea was to try to reach that landscape level or large scale level analysis capacity. Thank you. Thanks so much, Beatrice. And yeah, it's always a trade-off between uh, when you're making these kinds of app decisions, right? And and uh, so I'm excited to see how it's going to be used. Um, it's fantastic. Thank you. Our next talk is going to be by Nico Lang. Uh, he's a PhD student at ETH Zurich, and he works in the EcoVision Lab, focusing on advancing the way we measure forest structure at global scales using publicly available satellite data um, and he's helped also develop a map in Earth Engine discerning smallholder palm from large scale plantation palm. Um, he wasn't able to, to join us for the live Q&A today. Uh, so let's hear his talk and take it away. So thanks for the introduction. Today, I will talk about our research on high carbon stock mapping at large scale. So why are we interested in mapping carbon stocks? So while the need for deforestation-free global supply chains is widely recognized, making progress in practice remains a challenge. This issue led to the development of the so-called high carbon stock approach, short HCSA, which defines a toolkit for sustainable land use planning and forest conservation. The HCSA focuses on protecting high carbon stocks to reduce the impact of agricultural activities on climate change. The key component is the definition of the HCS threshold that distinguishes between high carbon stock forests and degraded lands. While the high carbon stock forests are protected, de degraded lands may be developed. While NGOs and companies both agree on the HCS de definition and use it in their no deforestation policies, it still remains a challenge to identify HCS forests at large scale. So our work addresses these challenging tasks um, by mapping canopy height as a very important indicator for HCS forests at large scale and tries to facilitate this implementation in practice. Therefore, we propose a two-step procedure. And on this slide, we show the first step where we developed a deep learning approach to combine remote sensing data from two ongoing space missions. So the Sentinel-2 optical images and the JEDI LiDAR. We train a deep convolutional neural network, a CNN, to estimate dense canopy height maps from the optical images. And the sparse but high quality forest structure data from the JEDI mission is used as a sparse supervision signal to train these models. 
We trained the model on data from Southeast Asia. And once the model is trained, it only relies on the optical images to make predictions and to create these dense canopy height maps. The second step is to derive the HCS categories from these dense canopy height maps. And for that, we use carbon density data from airborne LIDAR campaigns. Here, we see the distribution of estimated canopy heights for each of the HCS categories. And when we use this data to train a second, much smaller CNN, we can achieve an overall accuracy of 86% classifying high carbon stock forests against degraded lands. Here's a qualitative example that shows the two steps side by side. On the left, we have the Sentinel-2 input image, which is used to predict the canopy height map shown in the center. And on the right side, we have the indicative HCS classification that is derived from the canopy height map. So the bluish colors on the right side define the degraded lands. And on top, we visualize an oil palm plantation map from Rodriguez et al. to highlight and also exclude plantations from the HCS categories. We deploy our methodology on three countries for Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines and make these maps available as Google Earth Engine assets. And they can also be explored in our Google Earth Engine app, which is an intuitive tool even if you're not a Google Earth Engine user. So to conclude, we demonstrated that combining Sentinel-2 and JEDI data allows to map canopy height densely at country scale, and that these maps are predictive of classifying HCS forests versus degraded lands, with an accuracy that makes our approach relevant for practical applications. So the countrywide maps that we've created have great potential to support ongoing conservation efforts and deforestation risk analysis. This is the feedback that we received from practitioners that are already using our maps in their daily businesses. So if you find these maps relevant for your application or if you have feedback or questions, please reach out. And with this, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much, Nico. It's really fantastic work. Um, it's very commendable. And uh, for those in uh, watching live, if you have any questions for Nico, as he wasn't able to join us um, live for the Q and A section, if you type it in below, and and we can uh, we can put you in touch directly with him and get your question answered. Um, so next up, our last talk of the day is from John Husinski, and he's a research research scientist. Uh, at the Airborne, Observe Airborne Remote Sensing Group uh, at Battelle. Um, he's responsible for designing NEON's Airborne Remote Sensing flight campaigns involving the, the analysis of satellite airborne and near surface remote sensing observations to map ecological communities and develop and validate models of seasonal and interannual phenology and meteorology. So let's hear from John now. The National Ecological Observatory Network, or NEON, is a 30-year continental-scale ecological research facility sponsored by the National Science Foundation, designed to collect and share scientific data that characterize and quantify how the nation's terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems are changing. Composed of five measurement subsystems, the network covers 47 terrestrial and 34 aquatic field sites located in a range of representative ecosystems across the United States. At each field site, these subsystems acquire highly calibrated sensor measurements, field observations, and airborne remote sensing data, producing 185 data products on an ongoing basis. The NEON Airborne Observation Platform, or AOP, acquires meter scale hyperspectral imagery discrete and waveform LIDAR, and digital photography. These instruments complement the other NEON subsystems while enabling the scaling of field-based measurements to satellite remote sensing. Covering larger landscapes than individual field sites, we acquire data on upland watersheds, vegetation communities, and areas of natural and human disturbance that may impact ecological processes within the NEON sites themselves. Remote sensing data collected by the NEON AOP 
are used to generate 28 data products, many of them linked to terrestrial and aquatic collection protocols. All NEON data are freely available to the public through the NEON data portal shown here. Within NEON's Airborne Science Program, Earth Engine has played a critical role in providing access to the computing resources and data archives necessary for analyzing and understanding the environmental context in which we work. For example, one major constraint is the need for cloud-free sky conditions during our hyperspectral data acquisition. We use Earth Engine to analyze the full archive of daily MODIS satellite data to predict the number of days per month with less than 10% cloud cover during late morning flights over each site. These data are then fed into Monte Carlo simulations to estimate the number of days we need to spend at each site to have, for example, a 90% likelihood of cloud-free data collection. We also use Earth Engine to, to determine the times of year to survey each site while its vegetation is in peak greenness. Here is an R Shiny app depicting vegetation phenology, in this case at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in Maryland. This is produced from 19 years of MODIS Enhanced Vegetation Index, or EVI data, all processed through Earth Engine. Earth Engine has also been instrumental in allowing us to develop tools based on GO 16 and 17 satellite data for real-time cloud tracking during our airborne collection flights. It's also been critical for post-flight verification of weather quality at each of the sites that have been flown. Finally, we're beginning to publish the extensive archive of NEON airborne data within Earth Engine to streamline their use by external scientists interested in leveraging the information for ecological research at a continental scale. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, John, and welcome to our live Q&A. Um, I find the NEON Institute data collection, it just seems to be such an incredible, freely open resource for critical field data um, that's useful in so many different contexts. So what are some of the impacts of the data that you've seen in the, and especially resulting from the publicly available nature of the data and how, um, how does NEON plan to scale to, to uh, broader availability in more sites? Uh, that's a really great question. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks, Google, for having me uh, talk today. Um, well, we've been in operations for about four years. And um, in that time, we've seen uh, many publications come out. So, you know, the focus of the observatory is providing open, free access to ecological data across the continental United States. And um, since the, the observatory went into full operations, we've seen 352 peer review publications come out. 68 of those have actually been using the airborne remote sensing data, um, covering really wide range of uh, ecological science applications. Um, as far as AOP data is concerned, uh, we've seen uh, publications into explorations on relationships between uh, vegetation structure and heterogeneity, plant foliar traits, and you know canopy processes such as carbon assimilation, habit habitat diversity. Um, we've seen uh, a lot of the LIDAR data and hyperspectral data used in refinements in kind of ex exploring new algorithms for refining canopy height models and biomass estimations. Um, some really interesting applications in um, measuring biodiversity. Um, also kind of uh, uh, applications in geology and critical zone mapping, which is kind of a new area, um, certain, certainly for me. Um, so wide range of applications, you know, these data are really widely available um, across all the different sites. Um, much of the data is kind of coming into the system in real time. Um, as well as kind of these periodic collections, such as the ones that AOP conducts. Um, we host postdocs every year. So people who are interested in uh, a NEON postdoc um, can look for um, the openings that come up on an annual basis. 
We also sponsor a learning hub and a code hub on the Neon Science uh, webpage where one can access a whole range of uh, tutorials in R and Python, as well as uh, APIs for accessing Neon data and processing Neon data. And then there are um, other codes that have been developed for a whole range of things such as QA, data QA, et cetera. And so those are really interesting for tutorials. Um, and uh, as far as kind of outreach, science outreach, and NEON has been uh, collaborating with the AGU's Thriving Earth Exchange, which is kind of a network of 60,000 scientists. Um, and as part of that, um, NEON field scientists are conducting outreach with local communities, uh, kind of to launch uh, local collaborative uh, science projects that are co-developed co with those communities. So that's really kind of an exciting new uh, avenue to explore. Um, if anybody's interested in um, looking at impact, there is a whole section on impact on the Neon Science webpage that explores the uh, case studies, spotlights certain research um, that uh, is ongoing or, or kind of exciting new research areas, um, as well as uh, access to all of the publications that um, have come out uh, using Neon data. Awesome, thank you. And yeah, AGU was where I first learned about Neon, and I, you know, I thought this is amazing. I didn't, can't believe I hadn't heard about it before. So um, that was a while ago. But yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, thanks so much for telling our audience uh, more about how you've been using it today. Thank you. So um, yeah, and thank you to to our, our for our great talks, everyone. So we're going to welcome everybody, welcome you all back on the screen. Uh, everyone except for Nico, as I said, who can be with us. Um, but as I said, I'll, I'll, uh, we're happy to direct any questions to him over email, um, with your permission, of course. Uh, so let's look at the Q&A from the audience. We have some really good questions coming in. And feel free to keep entering more in until the top of the, air, top of the hour. Um, first up, we have a question for Emil from Rebecca Edwards. Uh, so how did you assess the accuracy of using land trender or the accuracy of land trender itself yeah thank you so much tanya and of course uh, thank you to becky for the for the question and the response will actually somewhat tie into the other question from uh josue and so just to say first off that the the work is still in pro in process and it's a subset of a of a larger work that the server network has been doing assessing uh different land cover change techniques for different uh, parts of the world However, to say that in 2010, we did do a, a subset looking at um, using land trender for looking at mangrove change specifically uh, in Belize, uh, comparing the change maps from land trender with uh, high resolution three meter uh, planet scope imagery uh, over a few years. And we found that the change data did have an accuracy of 98.1%. Uh, so just the change itself, right? Um, and so that's part of it. However, in terms of you know the the broader implications for for doing a bigger assessment for all of the MDC, um, still in process and uh, remains to be completed. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Emil. And did you um, did you want to add anything to Josue, Josue's question yeah. around? Yeah, is definitely. it possible with the land trend algorithm to detect the land change monthly? Um, his interest is about to detect le illegal logging activities in the Ecuadorian Andes. Yeah, thank you again. And thank you, Josue. Uh, so regarding uh, land trender, just to say that, again, as part of this uh, broader effort that other folks in the in the survey network have been doing in evaluating different um, change algorithms, specifically the ones that are available in Earth Engine, uh, including land trender, again, from, from Robert Kennedy and his team, uh, CCDC from from Sue and and Woodcock uh, and coded from from Eric Bullock and team. Um, we found that uh, land trender is usually parameterized to run annually, and so for for other parts of the the world, including the the the, the Amazon, uh, where they've done tests, they found you know that it's it's probably if you want to look at, at at a change that's not annual and you want to look at something finer temporally, uh, probably better to go with uh, CCDC or coded because. Uh, that's you know what those are are set up for. However, also um you know computationally expensive in that uh, CCDC encoded will go through you know every single you know scene in the Landsat archive, and depending on how large your your domain is, then it could take uh, a while. But again, uh, really awesome of the Earth Engine you know team to 
to have those algorithms there and you know have it basically kind of simple to be able to do that and also just to say that uh, afterwards perhaps through the chat uh, we can share some of those uh, resources that are that are freely available thank you that'd be awesome thanks Emil um our next question is sort of for for Beatrice but also I think for everybody <laughs> there's a lot of folks who could who, uh, who we have here today who could who could take a stab at this so um, where can we explore or search for existing public apps with relevance to nature, nature conservation like this? That was from Nate, Rachel Neugat, Neugatten. And um, we had a comment from Philip Gertner, who tries to update a list of quasi regularly at this GitHub page, which you can find in the, um, in the Q&A section below. Anybody else want to chime in on that? Like how to get information about, you know, nature conservation related Earth Engine apps? Uh, across the board. Yes, so the question was directed to me, but I, I knew about Philip's script that uh, looks uh, constantly looks for new apps, but th there are many tools being developed, I'm sure, but honestly, I don't know if there's a site listing specific applications for conservation. Maybe Tanya or one of the panelists knows more better than me. I'm sorry. If, if I could ask I was just going to agree with uh, with Beatrice that Philippe's work is is really excellent, and he also gave a a talk, uh, you know, lightning talk um, in the makerspace after Jew for Good uh, in November. And so, you know, he's done this labor of love for the for the broader community in, in curating this you know huge archive of things. And I think perhaps kind of speaking for the rest of the community as well, if there were some kind of support that uh, the Google Earth Engine outreach team could could provide in perhaps you know uh, also helping with. Uh, keeping up that list, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. But of course, we really appreciate all the work that Philippe, as well as uh, others have done in, you know, putting all that stuff together. Thank you. Yeah, just to add, it's Richard here. So often, you know, I work with the policy people uh, in, in the agency of the government, and often we talk to them and say, well, how do you get access to these sort of information? And they say, we, we Google it. So maybe it's an encouraging suggestion and maybe Google can help us so that we can Google the apps, uh, you know? Uh, deforestation in Timor, uh, high biomass uh, forests, uh, global mapping, and the app should pop up. I, I think that's a natural thing to do. We can maybe work together with you guys to to try it. It'd be cool. I love it. I love it. I think that's uh, yeah, completely makes it makes a ton of sense. And we'll take it back to the engineering teams and talk about it um, about the feasibility. So the next one is for Beatrice. Uh, she says this is from Amanda Stahl. Uh, I might consider using your app in a university course that I teach. Um, would Beatrice be reachable if I have questions? <laughs> yes, so I replied to Amanda, uh, of course, uh, please reach out to, to use the app for teaching. Uh, that's really exciting. I think uh, it's, it can be really interesting to just explore the data. And uh, I guess that um, for teaching purposes, maybe you don't have a uh, data available, some maybe yes, but uh, we can also um, work around with the sample data sets that uh, we already included. So you can freely use those uh, for for teaching purposes. So if you need any help, please please uh, reach out. Thank you. Thanks, Beatrice. And the last question, um, Richard, would you is from Richard to John? Do you want to just ask it live? <laughs> oh, I think you have to unmute. My amateur physics. Um, <laughs> uh, the field data sets would also be put on Google Earth Engine. We actually use them to validate our product because they're very systematic and, and they're really nice data sets. So I was wondering if they could be accessible. Yeah, that's through Earth Engine. Yeah. That's, that's a great idea. I've also used uh, some of the field data in Earth Engine, and you know, it's a, a uh, there's a process involved in trying to get them in there and um, to make them useful. Yeah, we are currently. Um, talking with the Earth Engine development team about first and foremost, uh, publishing all of the AOP uh, remote sensing data in Earth Engine. And so those will be available hopefully through the data catalog at some point, maybe within the next year. And then um, all of our data, all of NEON data are being published um, or they're being uh, stored now in the process of being stored in the Google Cloud platform which means it will be relatively easy to then open those archives to Earth Engine. Um, a lot of the data are point data, um, 
you know, there's, uh, it's not raster information. So um, it, I would need to learn more about how Earth Engine uh, utilizes all of these point data, but certainly it's something that um, we should facilitate as much as possible. Um, so we're, we're really excited about um, publishing data through Earth Engine. Um, it's an incredibly powerful platform and um, it's uh, our technical working groups have really been um, encouraging us to do so because it's um, a great resource to the science community. So we'll take you up on that, Richard, and um, hopefully we'll have something for you in the next uh, year or two. Awesome. Thanks so much, John. Um, one last question for Emil uh, from Wendy Whittle. Her question is builds on his uh, your interest in predictive Google tools to predict potential change, and she's wondering if there's any plans around that. Um, just just to say from from our side, no. But uh, to throw that back to, to you, Tanya, um, just as you know, uh, the Google Earth Engine uh, examples repository in the in the code editor when you know when when people you know, sign in, et cetera. There are all these uh, really great examples. Uh, we, we have noticed that, you know, um, it, it would be great if, if, if perhaps, you know, uh, some examples could be added to those. And so one thought that we, we did have was, you know, wondering if, if folks on the outreach team who, you know, contributed a, a great deal to the community, like, you know, uh, Nick Clinton or, or others, you know, might consider perhaps, you know, sharing some, some examples of codes there. But uh, I guess it, you know, it, it shouldn't be super complicated. Again, based on on, on previous change, um, having an idea of you know previous change plus other types of, of uh, factors. You know, there there are other types of, of models out there um, like clue conversion of land use and effects, and uses you know certain different types of factors based on you know past change as well as these other types of predictive things to then get an idea of okay uh, which you know which uh, areas of force could be changed in the future, and so. Um, Google Earth Engine is, is pretty versatile and powerful and figuring, you know, maybe if not somebody from the Earth Engine outreach team, other folks who might already be working on this in the community might want to, you know, share what they're they're working on there. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. I love it. Um, all right. So I think that wraps up our live Q&A session and, um, and also our talks all, all over our talks today. Thanks so much for joining today's session. Uh, a special thank you to our speakers for presenting today and sticking around. Some of you staying up late um, in other time zones to join us. Um, thanks to the audience for engaging questions to our speakers. And we hope you're inspired and you got some fresh ideas to take to your own research. So we also hope that you can join us for another Forest in Nature um, lightning talk round that's happening on Thursday at the same time, Thursday, January 27th, just a couple days from now, uh, day after tomorrow. And uh, we have a whole lineup of another five incredible speakers uh, for that talk, for that session. So thanks again and goodbye for now. Thank you.